Well, guys, despite this movie having a lot more bad mouthing and bad press out there online, this one is actually ranked better than its uh, predecessor, and that would be uh, 2007's uh, Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. It has a 37% on the tomato meter and a 51% on the audience score. And look at all those user ratings 1,339,000 plus user ratings. That is just simply fantastic, uh, taking into account that most of my Rotten Review episodes, I'm dealing with films that don't have even one-fifth of that number of audience uh, user reviews. Well, this one, it certainly should be accurate, right, with all that 1.3 million audience uh, reviews. Now, I don't know why it's so high. Like I said, this uh, sequel to the 2005 film is uh, bad-mouthed completely. Uh, it's considered really bad online. Everybody references this as being worse than the 2005 film, and yet the 2005 film actually has a better audience score, and it has a better uh, ranking on the tomato meter. Not by much. It's still rotten, but uh, this one is actually this one is actually a little bit better. Um, now, I don't know why that is. I'm speculating that it's because this one didn't spend so much of its time on the uh, quite awkward origin story that the first one had to do. But this one is certainly not some kind of fresh uh, comic book movie. It's certainly not a good Marvel film. It is one of the worst, despite it being just uh, slightly slightly better and more tolerable than the 2005 film. This one brings all of the characters back from the 2005 film, and I will say right off the bat that what was most off-putting to me was that in this second film, more so than the first, um, it was obvious that the um, the makeup artists and the lighting experts at uh, Fox Studios really struggled to make Jessica Alba look like a blonde-haired, blue-eyed white girl and she is just simply not that and it is very off-putting to see them try to transform her into that um, she is still very good looking very much uh, eye candy in the second film but in the first film it kind of looked believable to me that she was a blonde haired blue eyed girl and this one it's very off-putting and I'm almost going to say that her makeup effects almost look like CGI to me now for all I know maybe some of it was but I don't know, they call this whitewashing nowadays. I'm just going to call it a really um, glaringly bad way to make somebody look like something they're not. It was very off-putting to me. Um, I just couldn't take my eyes off the fact that she didn't look real. She didn't look believable. She looked like something totally created, um, just created like a cartoon character. She looked almost cartoonish. Um, despite the fact that she was vi uh, still visually appealing. But let's get right into the audience reviews and find out why people uh, consider this one rotten. I do have my own list, and it is chock full of plot holes, even more so than the first film. But let's get to those audience reviews. Um, we have the first one at the top from January 13, 2020, making it about a month old. Uh, two stars. It's pretty sad that this is the best Fantastic Four movie. Watch The Incredibles instead. Well, yeah, I'll repeat myself. This is actually the better of the two first films. And in fact, this one's highly, much higher rated than the uh, 2015 remake. Um, so yes, technically this is the best Fantastic Four movie by Rotten Tomato scores. Um, is it, in my opinion, well... Yeah, just a little bit, just by a little bit. And if I had to put a star ranking on this, I would say two stars. I largely agree with that. Uh, it wasn't boring enough that I shut it off. It came close, but um, I actually sat through this whole thing despite finding a lot of plot holes and logical fails with it. I'll say it was two stars. Um, never did I feel like fast-forwarding it. Now, of course, your mileage may vary, uh, but I'm usually pretty picky on the boredom aspect. If something bores me, I'll fast forward it, but in this case I didn't feel like I needed to. I'm not going to entertain five star or four star reviews. I'm just going to stick with three star and below because this is after all an episode of Rotten Reviews for a reason. 
Our next one-star review from December 1, 2019, somehow getting better reviews than the first one. This movie trying so hard to be funny, it's practically waving a sign saying, laugh now, this is humor. Not only that, it attempts to fool parents into letting their kids watch this by calling this PG. It is too inappropriate and violent for younger children. Well, I noticed that too. This one's rated PG. The others are rated PG-13. Um, I didn't notice that much of a difference in this one. So, yeah, I'll have to agree on that. Uh, small kids aren't going to find this less violent than the other ones, despite the rating. I didn't notice the difference. Um, and I'll agree with the reviewer on the humor. This one tried to put so much family drama type humor, uh, bachelor party type humor, wedding and wedding fail type humor. And, you know, I'm going into this thing expecting a Marvel comic book movie, and I'm just left with all this uh, pointless bachelor party wedding drama and banter and bickering between the main characters that we saw quite a lot of in the first film, but this film just dialed it up to 11 and just really wasted our time with a lot of this wedding bachelor party subplot. Um, I'll agree completely. It was just not necessary, and it took away from all the suspense that would have been in some kind of action uh, Marvel-esque film. You know, in a comic book story, you, ha you have your classic uh, good guys and villains, and you have to have some kind of tension, but it's hard to have that when you're just so busy with all the high school level and junior high level humor in this. It didn't work at all. I mean, it couldn't decide if it was a comedy family movie or if it was a comic book action adventure. It failed at both of those as a result. Uh, but let's move down here, September 29, one and a half stars. This was worse than the first that rhymed. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Uh, but this was so disappointing it gets a D minus. Yeah. I would say it's pretty rotten, but let's move on. I'm looking for a little more detail than that. Two and a half stars, better than the previous one at least. We'll see, that's a thing where your mileage is going to vary. Most people online, most of the talk online over the years on this film has been that this is the worst of them, the worst of the, uh, you know, the original two with these characters and with these actors and actresses. Somehow some people think this is better, and I'm, I'm curious about that, like why they thought this was better. Again, I'm saying it's because maybe they didn't have an origin story in this um, to drag it down, but it, to me this was not better. Half a star, August 19, zero stars, look at that. The first was bad enough, but they decided to try again and make an even worse film than before. It's like they salvaged a couple of scraps of shredded paper from a fire and turned them in for a screenplay. Well, yeah, plot hole wise, I'll agree with you on that. I, I lost track of all the plot problems in this, but let's just look at my handy list, which is quite long, and see what I wrote down as I found it. Well, first of all, the CGI, it's not a plot hole, but the CGI just doesn't age very well in this film. Despite the fact that the 2005 film, the CGI actually does hold up today in 2020, um, this one doesn't. I don't know what happened. I don't know, maybe there was a different uh, group or batch of companies involved in the special effects, but this one looks really bad, even right from the very few uh, opening shots showing the Earth in space and all of this, or, or another planet in space and Galactus. Um, the CGI really looks bad, and it has aged very poorly. Even the effects where Reed Richards is, is uh, kind of, you know, doing his rubber band, stretching antics on the dance floor, it looks really cringeworthy bad compared to um, the first movie. So it has aged very poorly. It's definitely a step down from the 2005 film. Not a plot problem, just a straight-up visual fail. Um, I already mentioned Sue Storm. Jessica Alba, it's just off-putting seeing them try to turn her into a Caucasian, blonde-haired, uh, blue-eyed woman. Doesn't work, and yet it worked pretty much for me in the first 2005 film. It just didn't work in this. The makeup effects were horrible. Uh, it looked too unrealistic, and especially you could tell her eyes had um, blue contacts in them, and I'm sure they did in the first film, but in this one it just looked really bad. I mean, maybe it was a, a lighting fail on top of the makeup. Um, now here's my first plot problem here. Um, why is the Fantastic Four shown flying in commercial airline flights in coach, no less? 
it's not explained because they have millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment in their New York base, their laboratory, and etc. And it's shown later in the film that they've got the money to develop their own high-tech flying jet aircraft, some sci-fi type vehicles. Yet they they need to spend, uh, they could, they're on a budget and they have to fly coach on regular airlines. And it's like, it doesn't make any sense at all. They just put that in the movie to put some humor in there with, you know, um, the the characters trying to squeeze into airline seats and the other passengers noticing who they are and it's just a complete fail and at one part where they're on this airplane in coach um, Johnny or uh, the Human Torch actually makes a joke kind of a joke at the audience that uh, why are they flying uh, coach why are they flying commercial why don't they get some sponsors and just get their own private jet well it's even more ridiculous than that because they flat out have the money to have their own private jet um, not to mention they could have the military or the government funding their travel expenses but nope they have to fly on commercial on coach really stupid right from the very beginning of this it's just like it doesn't even work in a Saturday morning cartoon it's not believable and let's go into another problem here um, the plot yes how do reeds close stretch you know, along with his body. In the first film, it is shown that, well, their uniforms, the material their uniforms are made out of, has also been exposed to the same radiation that their bodies have been. And so that's how they explain how their uniforms survived their powers um, in the first film, 2005. Now, in this film, they show Reed Richards on the dance floor in a nightclub, and he is dancing and twisting his body and doing all these kind of stunts with his stretch powers on a dance floor and he's wearing like a regular dress shirt with a sweater vest and regular slacks and all the clothes stretch with, with him just fine and don't get stretched wrinkled or to torn or anything and it's completely ridiculous and I guess this kind of logic would work in a Saturday morning cartoon but it doesn't work here because in the first film at least they explained some of this they only had this effect shown when they were you know wearing their um, Suit, suits which were made out of materials that had been in space exposed to that radiation but in this one they just hand wave it away and have normal clothes like performing these stretch routines with Reed Richards and it's just a complete fail um, they didn't even try again it's a step down you know it's kind of funny because this one has higher ratings than the first one at least on Rotten Tomatoes, and yet it's right off the first few scenes of this, I'm considering it, um, you know, more failed than the first one in a lot of ways. Not to mention that the wedding, the drawn out wedding scenes and engagement scenes and all this between Reed Richards and the drama going on there, it's very boring and it takes away from everything. I mean, you're just like almost wanting to check your watch. It wasn't bad enough. Like I said, it wasn't bad enough to make the whole film boring that I felt like I needed to fast forward it. But it was borderline getting there. It, it didn't need to be in this film. It was like the director and the writers just didn't have anything else to stretch the running time. So they put all this boring wedding subplot in there and the bachelor party subplot. Um, and you can, you know, it has a 92 minute runtime. So, you know, this film probably would have been like just 60 minutes long if you cut out the unnecessary wedding subplot bullshit. So I think, yeah, the writers just failed. They didn't know how to make a proper length movie with real substance to it. And that's pretty bad for a superhero film. Half a star, zero stars. Look at that. Um, yeah, I've read that one before, but it bears repeating, I guess. Two and a half stars, July 22nd. I didn't like this one as much. Well, neither did I, but, you know, I'm looking for a little bit more. Three stars, those EFX, ouch. The only reason I watched it was Doug Jones. Yeah, the visual effects were a step down from the 2005 film. I don't know why. I don't know why, and I don't know how this survives getting a better score with a, just a straight-up step down in the visual effects. Let's go into my handy list again. Um, there is, you know, I'll actually give the story writers and the director credit for being able to semi, somewhat sem semi-realistically work in product placement in a realistic way. For example, part of the uh, story is that uh, the Human Torch 
played by Chris Evans. He wants to actually, you know, have all these sponsors for the Fantastic Four, and he wants their uniforms to have all the logos from the different corporations that, you know, need to sponsor them. And that's a clever way for the director to actually do this actual product placement, and they do a lot of it. And they have Johnny Storm straight up wear a bunch of corporate logos on his outfit that are shown quite prominently to the audience many times throughout the film. Um, it's a very ingenious way of making that work in the story, but it's still kind of hitting you in the face with these different corporate logos like um, McDonald's and 7-Eleven and Dodge. And I'll just say that's where the you know the cleverness ends because at the end of this film they just wouldn't let it go with the Dodge advertising and the very sci-fi vehicle that uh, shows up at the end that Reed Richards has been secretly developing for use by the Fantastic Four this vehicle shows up at the closing act of the movie and it straight up looks like a Dodge vehicle on the front and has the Dodge logo and the word Dodge on it. And when Chris Evans looks at the Dodge logo on the front of this futuristic hover jet craft thing, he says, oh, am I? And then Reed Richard says, oh, of course. You know, like, yeah, yeah, like it's got a Hemi Dodge engine in it, this futuristic jet craft. And it's just so dumb, you know. So on one hand, I say they did a clever thing working pl product placement into the film uh, by saying that it was part of what uh, the Human Torch wanted. But then they just like go over the top with it throughout the rest of the movie. And in the final act, we're just like slapped in the face by the Dodge car company or truck company. And yeah, we didn't really need that. But let's continue on through the audience reviews. Look at all those four and three and a half star reviews. Um, it's kind of hard to believe. I'm not going to read those. Two and a half stars, January 20, 2019. Not the best Marvel superhero film. Yeah, well, it is not the worst. You know, we can go back to Elektra. We can go back to The Punisher 2004 with John Travolta. Those are worse than this, but this is pretty bad. And this features an actually pretty cool Stan Lee cameo. It's one of the best where Stan Lee actually plays himself, not some other character. And he is flat out, he flat out goes to the wedding between um, Reed Richards and Sue Storm. And he shows up and the person checking in the guests asks him who he is. And he says that he's Stan Lee. And then the guy looks at him and says, ah, nice try. Get out of here, pal. And he says, no, I'm really Stan Lee. And that actually worked. That was one of Stan Lee's best cameo appearances, playing himself no less. Um, but unfortunately, the rest of the film doesn't uh, live up to that as a Marvel film. That was probably the only good part of it. The rest of this as a Marvel film is pretty much a straight-up uh, dud and should be forgotten about. But let's move on. Two stars, December 16, 2018, making it more than a year old. The Silver Surfer, Chase, was cool, but oh boy, the rest is bad. Well, I'm going to disagree on that. Um, the Silver Server himself is another example of really cheap special effects. Yeah, it kind of looks cool the first time you see it for a few seconds, this silver humanoid on a silver surfboard, but it's very cheap. It's very easy. It's something that people could do at home with Adobe After Effects. They really could. Um, and you see the Silver Surfer get chased by... Uh, by the Human Torch throughout different environments, you know, culminating in China at the end, like a lot of these films do now. And there's nothing that exciting about it. We've seen this before. Um, even visual-wise, it's like B-grade visual effects that, you know, a lot of people at home can pull off this same type of stuff with some effort. Um, nothing spectacular there. Nothing really exciting. In fact, I'll say nothing in this film really had me excited. Even if this were just a Saturday morning cartoon, Mm, there's nothing stand out here. There's nothing that would make me not just forget all about this like 20 minutes later after it's finished. Three stars. Despite all that, three stars. Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer ditches its energetic and wild source material of awesome space battles and cool villains and brings us an acceptable follow-up to its critically panned predecessor that tries too hard to deliver a sequel that is much better and more fleshed out than its original film. Therefore, it fails at doing so. Wow, why do these people not understand punctuation? I'll read on nonetheless. Nonetheless, director Tim Story is able to provide the audience with entertainment and laughs despite some of the jokes falling flat. 
Some of the jokes fell flat. Um, I'd say almost every joke in this was too obvious. It didn't make me laugh, and so um, it fell flat. That's almost all of the jokes. I can't recall a single time during this film, one single moment that I laughed out loud. Whereas in the first film, one or two scenes made me laugh a little bit, so I'm going to say it's a fail. Moreover, the film contains too many digitally, well, let me just guess what he's going to say, too many digitally enhanced uh, things that don't look real. It's a definite step down in the realism department. Now, I don't know if it's a step down in the actual budget. The visual effects budget might actually be higher in this film. Certainly the makeup budget was higher for Jessica Alba, and yet it straight up didn't look real. Two stars, October 11, 2018. Much better than its predecessor, really. But it's still an awful movie. Worst, worst superhero movie and comic book movie of 2007. Um, it might be because I just don't know what else was out there in 2007. They turned Galactus into a giant purple cloud. What the fuck? Why does this god-awful movie have a higher audience score than The Hulk and Daredevil? This movie should have at least a 31% RT audience score. Um, yeah, so they're saying that uh, this should have lower audience scores. I'll agree. I think the first one, I mean, there was more stuff in there. I mean, yeah, it had problems. It spent a lot of time on an origin story, but the humor worked better. The visual effects stood the the, the visual effects straight up look fine in 2020 to me, the first film from 2005. This one, I don't know what happened. Two and a half stars, August 11, 2018. It's a movie that probably should have been a TV series. Uh, maybe if it was a Saturday morning cartoon, this would have all worked. But as a TV show, mm, I'm not even sure if the CW would appreciate this as a TV show because it's just like trying way too hard with a whole lot of too much money. Um, if this were a CW show, it would have to reduce the budget a lot and they would change it up because of that. So no, I'm going to say no, this wouldn't work. Uh, it's too high budget. It's simply too high budget. And because of that too high of a budget, it shows you how much of a fail it really is. Something with this kind of budget shouldn't have been this bad. June 23rd, 2018, half a star. Very stupid, much bad. Big cliche, written by a kid. Yeah, it feels like something written for a Saturday morning cartoon, but it's not quite that good either. Uh, two and a half stars, June 6, 2018. For a time when this movie came out, it was a better option for superhero movies. Just start of how things were going to quickly change for the better with the phasing of the MCU. Well, yeah, the next year after this, we got Iron Man. And that turned it all around for Marvel films, created what we know of as the MCU. And really, that's striking. Just think about this film from 2007, and then one year later, you're looking at Iron Man with uh, Robert Downey Jr., and wow, what a difference. What a difference a year makes, right? Uh, two stars, overall an improvement over the previous film, with a few stellar moments and interesting concepts that actually make for some neat visuals, but the simplistic nature of its narrative, subpar acting, cringy humor, and the terrible writing for some characters, like a certain Doctor Doom. Yeah, Doctor Doom showed up in this. I can't even remember what happened to him in the last one, but in this one, he's like in some kind of stasis storage container and he escapes from it. You know, I just don't even recall if that's where he ended up in the first one. In this one, he uses power from the Silver Surfer surfboard device to rejuvenate himself and charge himself back up. And now he looks like his old Victor Von Doom character, all flawless and perfect, with perfect hair. Yet he can shoot force lightning, not lightning out of himself like the Emperor Pal Pal Palpatine from Star Wars. And it really doesn't work because he's a little bit too sympathetic. And once again, he's just out to betray everybody and get the Silver Surfer's power. At the end, he's dispatched in a very boring way through a, on a chase with, once again, on a chase with an overpowered uh, human torch. And he ends up floating off or sinking down into the ocean. And I guess presumably if they made a third movie in the series, he was going to return out of the depths of the ocean or something. But in this, he just, we last see him sinking down into the ocean. And that's it. That's how he uh, disappears. It's completely pointless. They shouldn't even have brought him back in this film because really he added nothing to the story. 
they should have done something else here. Um, but let's go back to my handy list. Um, another plot problem. How does, uh, you know, it's shown that Reed Richards can go back to his laboratory and he can view other planets across the galaxy. I don't just mean view them like, you know, he can see them at a distance at distant points of light or whatnot. No, he can actually view and analyze the surface of planets in different parts of the galaxy and he can determine that they've been attacked by some mysterious force, which is, of course, Galactus, because presumably these planets were all healthy and good before and now he's viewing them on his scanner and all of a sudden they're dead worlds that weren't that way before. But it never explains to is what technology is Reed Richards using to view the surfaces of other planets and other galaxies and wouldn't this technology be useful to the government and wouldn't he have been able to sell this and use the money to like upgrade them with a private jet? I mean a lot of this doesn't make any sense. It just hand waves away all this miraculous technology that Reed Richards has that he doesn't presumably make any money off of and they're flying commercial flights and it doesn't add up. It's just a big plot hole that the movie just expects you to not notice. But somehow, Reed Richards, he's viewing these distant worlds, and he can see that Galactus has devastated them. Okay. So that just tells you that um, this movie, it just doesn't give a shit about these plot holes. Another plot problem, the army gives the Fantastic Four a ride in what is, like, I guess it's... um. I don't know the specific model of the helicopter, but we've seen these since the Vietnam era. It's an army helicopter, you know, um, forgive me, I don't know the exact model. But in any case, they used to call them Hueys back in the uh, Vietnam days. Now, this army colonel, he gives them a ride. They start out in the New York area, and suddenly they're flying into London. like. An army helicopter, a Huey, from back in the day, it can fly across the Atlantic and fly from New York to London, no problem. I'm sorry, the movie just hand waves that away too so that the Fantastic Four can get off the helicopter in London and fight the big bad in the middle of London. What else is next? Plot problems. Um, yeah, right in that same scene after they have this big battle and... Uh, the Silver Surfer makes a hole underneath the River Thames in London, and within like less than three or four minutes, it drains the entire River Thames, every drop of it down the hole, and the river's completely vanished, and the entire River Thames river system is just all dry with all the ships floating there on completely dry land. That all happens within three to five minutes, probably less than five minutes in the film. Again, this doesn't even work in a Saturday morning cartoon. It doesn't. Even kids would be like, wait a minute, what? You know, this is really bad. Let's move through some more audience reviews. Two stars. No, I read that one. Three stars. A nice and thoughtful superhero film. Nothing more. Um, you're giving this way too much credit. Three stars. Better than the nearest... Uh, better than the newest Fantastic Four, meaning better than the 2015 film. Mm not in the plot problem uh, category, but anyway, but not as good as the first. I didn't like the story much, but maybe that's how the comics went. I love Jessica Alba, and I'm glad they at least got the whole cast from the first movie. Yeah, they got the whole cast from the first movie, with more cringy, stupid family uh, wedding drama that didn't work. And so I'll say it was a fail. All these same characters did a better job in the first film, despite the fact that it wasted most of the running time on an origin story. It was still better than this, in my opinion. I don't know how people are saying this is better. It fails in every way versus the first one. Fails visually, fails plot-wise, fails um, being a little bit more boring, fails with humor. So, one and a half stars, February 4, 2018. Even worse than its predecessor, yes which is an embarrassment since the first Fantastic Four was not a good movie. The wedding storyline was horrible. Doctor Doom was completely unnecessary, Galactus was awful, and the thing was underused. At least the Silver Surfer was good. No, the Silver Surfer was not good. The Silver Surfer was just like, we don't even know. It's one of my plot problems. The Silver Surfer in this film is a slave or servant of Galactus. He comes along ahead of time and just like preps planets for destruction by drilling holes through them for some purpose. I don't know why. It never explains why 
these holes have to be drilled through these planets by the Silver Surfer before Galactus can come along because Galactus is shown to be this giant Ganic, uh swirling dust cloud in space that presumably just by size alone can easily swallow the earth. Why would you need to drill holes in the earth? I have no purpose. I have no clue and the movie never attempts to explain this. And furthermore, this uh, slave servant of Galactus called the Silver Surfer, he straight up uh, at the beginning of the film, that's his job. He says uh, he doesn't have a choice. Nobody has a choice. He's going to do what he's told by Galactus, and he's going to prepare the Earth for its destruction, and everybody just better accept it because that's what's going to happen. And then later in the film, at the end, he just decides to suddenly, for no reason at all, just change his mind and decide to kill himself, defeating Galactus and saving the Earth. That's right. He suicides himself killing Galactus and himself to save the Earth. It's not explained why. Jessica Alba's character, Sue Storm, she has a conversation with him, kind of a one-sided conversation with him for a little bit, maybe one or two scenes. There's really no response from the Silver Surfer as to what what uh, the pleadings of Jessica Alba, you know, why they would affect him or why he would give a shit what she said. But all of a sudden, he just decides, oh, it's time for me to suicide myself and become the good guy. What? Plot fail. Complete plot fail. It's one of my main plot fails. Uh, it's never explained. Never explained. The movie never even attempts to explain, even before the credits roll, how any of this makes any sense. So yes, it's much worse than the first one. Let's see, what else do we have here? Two and a half stars, December 22nd, 2017. Enjoyable. Not really. Occasionally thrilling and with great FX. Although rather redundant as far as the characters and themes go. In other words, it doesn't have much to add to the first film, but remains a pleasant watch. And one more thing, it's not that I have a problem with overblown subplots, but with crucial scenes taking place in England and Germany, where the fuck are the respective armies and governments? Why is it all up to the U.S. Army and the Fantastic Four? And they couldn't even get an evacuation right. Yeah, well, this reviewer leads me to another major problem I had with the film. You know where the U.S. Army has their secret base that they put aliens when they capture them? They put the Silver Surfer there when they want to put him in a controlled environment and study him. Yes, that's right. The U.S. Army has a secret base in Siberia. Really? Um, I guess the writers didn't realize... Uh, the writers didn't realize that Siberia is controlled by the Russian Federation. It is not controlled by the U.S. government. It is not a part of Alaska. I'm thinking that the writers confused Siberia and Alaska which I guess it would be easy to do if you were like um, maybe a fifth grader, maybe a fourth grader. You could confuse these things when you wrote some kind of comic book story. But for screenwriters in Hollywood, they're this stupid. The U.S. Army has a base in Siberia. Yeah, and then let's just go into another little problem in the movie. They fly about three minutes outside this base in Siberia, and suddenly they're in populated... They're, well, first they're over the Great Wall of China in a less than two minutes. And then about a minute later, or less than a minute later, they're suddenly flying into populated areas of China that look very much like Shanghai or Beijing. Wow, you know, that's incredible. Except the problem is the vehicles they're flying in never even break the speed of sound. So again, maybe this works in a kid's cartoon on some level, but even there it doesn't work very good. I mean, I don't know what happened with this film. Yes, it's got a PG rating, so maybe it was meant for little kids only. Uh, I don't know what happened here, but this is a complete logical fail. I mean, it's so damn stupid, I just don't have words to describe what happened here. Yeah. The U.S. Army, they've got this big base in Siberia. That's, But that's the least of the plot problems. But that's... Thank you for reminding me. Um, let's see. Three whole big stars. September 2nd, 2017. When I was 17, I loved it. Now as an adult, I think it's better than okay. It's problems. It still has ham-fisted plot points, though they're more planned out this time and they're not as bad as the first. 
At least this one didn't feel like a checklist. I found the Silver Surfer too bland in this movie. His story for destroying planets is very thin. Would have been better if it was mind control. Also, he had the power to destroy Galactus. Why didn't he just do that before he went on to kill planets for him? Yeah, that's what I already mentioned. And not only did he have the power to destroy, destroy Galactus before, but why did he all of a sudden decide to kill Galactus now for no reason? What? But yeah, thank you for reminding me that uh, the Silver Surfer could have killed Galactus at any time before Galactus ever encountered the Fantastic Four or Earth. So none of this disjointed shit makes any sense. It's all a complete logical fail. Let's see. Uh, what else is on my list? Uh, that's about it, I think. That's about it. I think I've covered about everything on my list. And thanks to the reviewers uh, on the three star and below reviews that have like sped me along on that. Uh, three stars here from August 10th, 2017. Meh, it wasn't that bad. Well, it wasn't as bad as Electra. Okay, I'll give you that. Two and a half stars, again, July 2017. Maybe it is a slight improvement over the first Fantastic Four, but it is still poorly scripted, full of cringeworthy moments and overused special effects. Yeah, that's being too kind. It really is. Two stars, June 2017. The Fantastic Four is one of the coolest most recognizable superhero teams in existence, so choosing the group for a series of movies seems like a no-brainer, right? All they'd need to do is bring in a decent cast, including a couple young stars, and make sure the effects look anything but cheesy. The first fan fa Fantastic Four detailing the group's uh, origin was a little slow, as origin stories can be. Uh, yeah, so... I'm not going to read that whole plot summary there, but yeah, I think that's what happened here. I think this one is actually rated higher because it isn't dragged down by the long origin story of the first one. But just as a standalone film, just judging this as, a, a, as any kind of action movie, much less a Marvel movie, this is quite worse than the first one because this thing has plot holes that you can drive thousands of gigantic spaceships through. How you can drive Galactus through all the plot holes in this thing. And I'll just say I'm not a big Fantastic Four comic book fan. I don't know much about it at all, but I can tell you that I know for a fact that Galactus, as portrayed in this film, wasn't this big, swirling dust cloud. And I think in the MCU, we are going to see Galactus done in the MCU. That's the plan, and it won't be anything like what was shown in this failed movie. This does not deserve a 51% audience score. I think it's just that it didn't have that origin story, and maybe the audience for this was younger. Maybe if you're eight or nine years old, this movie worked for you more than it would have otherwise. Hence the PG rating on this one versus the PG-13 on the others. Um, yeah, it's just a straight up fail. I don't think I can add anything more to this other than to say that I disagree with at least uh, over five, six hundred thousand. There's over six hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, people that have left audience reviews on this thing that I completely disagree with, and I'll leave it at that. And I will see you on the next episode of Rotten Reviews.